Hello, welcome. It's good to see you. Today is Wednesday, July 22nd. Glad to have you a part of our Wednesday virtual prayer meeting. Uh, today I want to continue with what we've been uh, talking about the last couple of weeks. Two weeks ago, uh, we talked about uh, division, how our enemy, Satan, will create division within the church. And if we get busy fighting amongst ourselves, then how can we fulfill the Great Commission? Uh, and that's one of his tactics. And we talked about how coming out of COVID-19 and all the issues with race and rioting and all the things that are going on in our nation, right now is a time where the enemy can make some headway if we're not careful uh, by creating division in the church. And then last week, we talked about really division within ourselves, spiritual division. And I wanna continue with that thought process uh, these have all been related to an article by Chuck Lawless, a professor, and uh, he has a blog, and I encourage you to just do a little Google search for Chuck Lawless, and you'll pull it up. He's probably one of the most impactful writers that I know of today. He, he says things in a way that are very practical for me spiritually, not just as a pastor, but as a Christian, and so I encourage you to follow along with his blog as well. But today, we're gonna to talk about 10 ways the enemy lures us into sin. 10 ways the enemy lures us into sin. Here, re remember this. If we get caught up in our sin, and oftentimes the enemy, he will, uh, he will not only guide us, help us, tempt us into that sin, but then once we've created that, or once we've participated in that sin, then comes the accuser and he just wants to pour the guilt and the shame on us, uh, then what happens is we get so caught up in where we are spiritually that we are no spiritually good to the kingdom of God. So it's important, especially during the times that we're going through now, that uh, we are on the uh, that we're aware uh, of that the enemy is out there trying to attack us, and that we need to do everything that we can to prevent his attacks or to repel his attacks. So, I point you back to Ephesians chapter six, verse twelve, a verse that probably is very familiar, but it says, "For our struggle is not against flesh and blood." but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. What we have to remember here on this earth until God calls us home, either through the rapture or through our death, and we go to be eternally with the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven, while we're on this earth, we will continually to be in a battle with our enemy. And oftentimes it's easy to focus on the earthly or the flesh part, but in reality, it's a spiritual battle and we need to recognize that so that we can take the proper steps to uh, defeat our enemy, Satan. Um, Chuck Lawless goes on and says, we don't always win uh, these battles. Knowing how the enemy works, however, can aid us in living in victory. And that's what God wants. That's what the Holy Spirit is inside of us to do, is to help us live in victory. Here are some ways the enemy seeks to lure us into sin. Remember, there's 10 things. First of all, he simply capitalizes on our flesh. He simply capitalizes on our flesh. Even as believers, we still battle against the flesh. Sometimes we're easy prey because, listen, we choose not to fight very hard. We choose not to fight very hard. In other words, we're our own worst enemies, not Satan and his forces. One of the things that I think it's important for believers to do uh, are to build those hedges of protection. And we talked a little bit about this last week, particularly in those areas where we struggle with sin. You know, everybody's different. Different things impact different people. Different sins have a different level of 
hold on people. And so what bothers me may not bother you and vice versa. But in those areas where we have recognized that we have a weakness, then we need to build those hedges of protection. Let me give you an example. Uh, on all of my uh, electronic uh, stuff, whether it's my phone, iPad, computer here at work, computer at home, we have uh, what's called Covenant Eyes. It is a, a, a filter, if you will, that it filters out uh, pornography and a lot of stuff that if you're not careful of, you can run into on the internet. Now, I have no intention of looking at pornography, but you know what? You don't have to have an intention to look at pornography. Stuff pops up all the time, and what this does, it does two things. One, it blocks anything that it recognizes as a pornographic site, but also it gives a report that my wife looks at. She looks at the whole family, and she helps hold the whole family, including me, accountable through the covenant eyes. So, she may come to me and say, now, Keith, what, what was going on here? And usually there's a good explanation, but I, I, I have built in a hedge of protection. Listen, I'm a man. I'm very visually oriented. We tend to be drawn, drawn to things like pornography. I know that in a moment of weakness, I could fail, and I don't want that to happen. So by having the covenant eyes in place, it just builds that hedge of protection for me. Now, we've got to work hard. Now, yes, we're empowered by the Holy Spirit, and we need to be spiritual about this, but also we need to do all that we can humanly to put those barriers, those hedges of protection in place to help keep us from sinning. We don't need to be our own worst enemies. Number two, uh, he magnifies the pleasure while minimizing the conviction. He magnifies the pleasure while minimizing the conviction. Let's just be honest, sin is enjoyable. It, 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 it's something we want to do. It's, it's, it's fun to do. It's pleasurable to do. Otherwise, we wouldn't give a rip about it. And Satan knows that. And so he, he, he is like fishing. He casts that lure out there and reels it in, hoping that we're going to bite. And uh, then he has us hooked. Uh, Lawless says, all we focus on is what we will get in if we choose to give into temptation, not what conviction we'll experience after we give in. The immediate is to focus on the pleasure, not on the conviction. Listen, if you're a child of God, if you've been saved, you're indwelt with the Holy Spirit and understand when you sin, the Bible tells us that you will come under conviction. You hear me? You will come under conviction. And by the way, if you're able to sin and sin freely without conviction, then you need to think through your walk with the Lord and whether you truly are his child. We don't need to think about the temptation. We need to, or excuse me, we don't need to think about what we're going to get in the immediate we need to think about the long term, the conviction that's going to come from God. And of course, the reason God does the conviction is because he loves us. He doesn't want us to live that way. He wants us to confess that sin and we'll be forgiven of that sin and we'll be able to move on free of that sin. Number three, he turns our attention to the immediate rather than the eternal. He turns our attention to the right now instead of thinking about the eternal. Sin is often about getting something right now. You know, we live in a what I call a drive-through society. We want, uh, we want the microwave version of everything. We want to be able to push the one-minute button and have whatever it is. And, and that's the way a lot of times we think about our sin. And when the temptation comes, man, we want it now. And, and that's the thing about sin is it it's immediately there for us to take part in. But what we have to do is we have to think about the long term. We have to think about the eternal in this case. 
Number four, he directs us to what we're missing rather than to what God has already given us. He directs us into what he says we're missing instead of what God has already given us. Think about Adam and Eve in the garden. Uh, what Satan did was tell them, listen, think about what God's withholding from you. Think about what he's not uh, letting you do instead of look standing back and look at the picture of how God had blessed them in a perfect environment. And oftentimes that's what happens to us. It's like Satan's whisper in our ear, man, you're really missing something good. If you would just do this, or if you would think this, or say this, man, you're really going to be in for something special. But again, we have to think, like step back, we have to look at the big picture, and we need to understand how God has blessed us. If you're a child of God and you've been saved, that's the greatest blessing of all. And if we really recognize how God has saved us and what he saved us from, why wouldn't we want to be obedient to him? And why wouldn't we want to think about the big picture instead of the uh, of what we're missing? Number five, he diverts and distracts us from spending time in God's word. Listen, I, I, I struggle with this. You know, good things can be distractions from us being in God's Word. You know, I, I come into the office and, and there's always things waiting on me, always things to do, and you know what? They're good things. They're, in, in one sense, godly things, ministry-related things as a pastor. But you know what? If that gets in the way of me doing the best thing, then it can easily become a temptation. It can easily become sin. I've got to hear from God. I've got to be in God's Word. If I want to know God, we've got to be in God's Word. If I want to hear from God, we've got to be in God's Word. And nothing can take away from us doing that. And if we allow even good things to get in the way of doing that, you know what? that can become a temptation, that can easily become sin. Uh, one of the things I have to do is protect that time in which I spend with the Lord. It may not always be the same time every day. I know some people, they love to get up at four o'clock in the morning and, and go directly uh, to reading God's word. Well, you know what, it doesn't work that way for me. At four o'clock in the morning, I hope I'm still asleep. But there has to be that time of day where I set aside, where I get along with God, read his word, and pray. Well, number six, he reminds us that yesterday's sin didn't always bring consequences. He reminds us that yesterday's sin didn't always bring consequences. By the way, how do you know yesterday's sin didn't bring consequences? Maybe you haven't seen the consequences yet, or maybe those consequences will be eternal, but understand, if you sin, there will be consequences. Whether it's now or in the future, there will be consequences for sin. Oftentimes, we, we think we've gotten away with something. And by the way, it, it kind of reminds me of the illustration I love to use uh, of my son when he was a little boy, three or four years old, and uh, he, I, I was fussing at him, and he was standing there, and he just closed his eyes, and because he couldn't see me, it was as if I wasn't there, as if I couldn't see him, and that's kind of how we are. It's silly, but that's really how we are with God. God sees it all. He, he knows our thoughts. He knows even before we commit the sins what we're going to do. We don't get away with anything. And that's one of the lies of Satan to believers. Hey, you didn't get caught last time. You can get away with it again and again. And the reality is sin's going to find you out. Whether it's now or in the future, we will 
have to feel, have to deal with that sin. Number seven, he convinces us that our sins aren't as bad as they could have been. They're certainly not as bad as others. I, I've played this game before. You know what? I haven't murdered anybody. I haven't robbed a bank. I, I haven't done you know, I've not done the bad stuff. I've just done little things. My sins are just little things compared to that. Listen, it doesn't work that way. In God's eyes, when we sin, it's sin. And we can't justify our sins based on the fact we think other people are worse sinners or other sins are worse sins when we sin we sin against a holy God, and he simply will not have it. Number eight, he exploits weak repentance. He exploits weak repentance. Let me read to you what Chuck Lawless says, because I thought this was a very good point. He's not alarmed by the prayer, God forgive me. You know, we, oh Lord forgive me, or God forgive me of all my sins. When we already know we're going to commit the sin again. Have you ever done that? Prayed, asked God to forgive you when you know darn well you're going to do it again? I have. I've been caught in that trap. I've been caught in that temptation. He says this, confession and repentance without brokenness. And that's the key. When we understand that when we sin against a holy God, the, how that creates a a barrier between us and fellowshipping with God. And we don't lose our salvation. But as we sin, it, it, I've, I've heard it put this way before, it's like a window that gets dirty. The light begins to have a harder time penetrating. And when we confess that sin, it's like that window gets cleaned all over again. But we need to understand when we confess and truly mean that confession, we're broken over our sin. We, we understand that our sin is against a holy God, and the heart's desire is never to do that sin again. Now, yes, we might re redo that sin, but when your prayer is, oh, well, God, forgive me, knowing darn well you're going to do that sin again, it, it doesn't bother Satan. It doesn't bother our enemy. It doesn't do anything for us. Number nine. He persuades us that we can handle it when we put ourselves in a potential place of temptation. Listen to this now. He persuades us that we can handle it when we put ourselves in a potential place of temptation. Uh, you, the old phrase, uh, you play with fire, you're going to get burned. That's exactly what he's talking about here. Uh, we can't straddle the fence. There's the fence of the world on one side and that which is godly on the other. And I see so many Christians, they want to know how close to the line can I get and still be a Christian and still be okay with God. And folks, if we're asking those questions, then there's something wrong spiritually. Our, our, our question should be God and by the way, he answers this in his word, but God, through your word, you tell us how to live a life that honors you. And, and when we're obedient to that life, uh, but, but listen, we, we, I see so many people, it's like they want to dip their toe across that line, cross the fence, and dabble just a little bit in sin, and the next thing you know, the enemy grabs them and pulls them across. We have to be very careful that when we make a choice to kind of try and ride that fence line, that, that's just, that's, that's a recipe for trouble. That's a recipe for sin because this world's gonna pull you in. So we need to be obedient to God's word and make sure we stay clear of the fence. No fence straddling, we don't wanna get burned. And then finally, number 10, he blinds us from seeing the beauty of Christ and the joy of honoring him. He blinds us for seeing the beauty of Christ and the joy for honoring him. Listen, the enemy wants us to think that God is this cosmic killjoy. 
and that he doesn't want us to have any fun. He doesn't want us to have any pleasure that we're not to enjoy anything. Listen, I want you to know if you're a child of God, the greatest days of your life is when you're living for the Lord and when you honor him through obedience, period. When you're in his will and you're living for him, that is the greatest for that you cannot buy into the lie of our enemy that says, well, if you don't do this, then you're not having any fun. That, that's simply not true. We need to celebrate uh, by praising him and obeying him. I close with this. Let me ask you this question. I, I don't know who's watching or listening, but how does the enemy lure you into sin? What are those areas that you struggle with? Let me encourage you. Get in God's word. Pray. If you need to, go see your pastor or a trusted Christian friend and just talk about it. Oftentimes, when we talk with one, uh, one another, it is a tremendous help. It lifts that burden off of us. I'll leave you with 1 Thessalonians 5.17. It's kind of the theme verse since we've been doing the virtual prayer meetings pray without ceasing pray without ceasing and that's what we have to do if we want to defeat the enemy particularly in the area of temptation of sin let me pray for us and then we will be finished today father god we thank you for your word the power that it has we thank you that we don't have to give in to the enemy but lord we do know that he's there and as you say he's like a roaring lion looking to devour anyone. And Lord, we don't want that to happen. So Lord, I pray that we will seek you and seek to live for you and be a, have a life of obedience to your word. And uh, Father God, we know that you'll bless that. Lord, I pray for those that are watching that you'll bless them in their homes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I hope you have a wonderful day.